Okay. Um, I, think, I think it's working right now. So, what we need to cover are um, types of dialysis, and also we'll uh, briefly go over a, a kidney transplant. Um, so, you have to go back to, you know, foundations and remember all these uh, osmosis, diffusion, and all that, brush up on all those things. But realize that the principle of dialysis, um, we have two major types, peritoneal and hemodialysis. We also have CRT. Um, but we generally think about dialysis as, as diffusion of material solutes, toxins across the semi-permeable membrane. Um, and remember that diffusion is movement of solutes from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. When you talk about solids, or you talk, when you talk about diffusion, you talk about solids, toxins, materials, things. But when you talk about osmosis, it's the movement of water, right? So, um, but and dialysis also uh, removes fluids, not just toxins. So these, we we talked about indications for dialysis, um, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, especially. Um, so, and then there's also other reasons for dialysis when the person doesn't necessarily have renal failure. Um, so maybe the person has had a drug overdose, so we need to quickly get that toxin out of their system. We can dialyze it out, maybe one or two sessions. But overall, we're thinking about the person who is fluid volume overloaded, has severe uremia, chronic kidney disease, maybe acute kidney injury, right? Generally, uh, hemodialysis is what you're going to see in, in clinical practice. So when you have patients that are getting dialysis, the majority of the time we're talking about hemodialysis. Um, and basically, uh, the semi-permeable membrane in hemodialysis uh, is a, is a uh, dialyzer, and they call it the kidney. Um, so, and I'll show you, I'll talk more about that. And the principle of ultrafiltration is the removal of fluid during hemodialysis. Peritoneal dialysis has, is the same principle. It removes toxins and fluid, but it uses the peritoneum or abdominal cavity wall as the semi-permeable membrane. CRT, it's basically like hemodialysis, but it's slower and continuous and used in patients that are more unstable. Now this isn't working. Unstable, yep. <laughs> So, to perform hemodialysis, we need vascular access, right? Um, so, we need a large vessel because we have to exchange blood very quickly and in large amounts. So, there's three main types of, of, of vascular access uh, types for hemodialysis. The one that you're going to see mostly in the hospital in acute situations is a vas cap. A vas cap is basically a central line. The non patient had one yesterday. Um, so this patient is going to have basically a central line that is used as a um, hemodialysis port. There's also AVFs and AVGs, arteriovenous fistulas and grafts. This is a picture of a, of a fistula. Remember that the term fistula means an opening between two things that normally there is not an opening, right? So like an esophageal tracheal fistula is a hole between the esophagus and fistula that's not normally there. But this fistula is created usually in the lower or upper arm um, so that you have exchanged, so that it, it mixes the venous and the arterial system at that point. Um, let's see, so the anastomosis, the, the, the fusing together of an artery and a vein. Um, and before this, this ABF can be used, it has to heal for about three months. So this person probably will have a vas cap before that, and we'll be doing dialysis on them with a vas cap while their AVF is healing. If you've ever had a patient with the AVF, um, it looks very odd, um, and uh, if you touch it, it feel, you can feel a thrill. So a thrill is, is a, is a machine-like vibration, kind of. Um, and that's a normal finding in an AVF. Also, if you were to auscultate the area, 
he would hear a he would hear a brewery. He would hear the blood rushing through that area. All right. And just noted that a person who has peripheral vascular disease, um, it's more difficult, basically, to do any manipulation to their vessels. So it's difficult to get an AVF in a person with a history of severe peripheral vascular disease. So AVG, a graft, um, is not the fusing of the vessels themselves. It's a graft. It's a synthetic connection between the venous and the arterial system in the, in the arm. And then to access this graft, you would would not puncture the vessels, you puncture the, the graft itself. So just think about this graft as a bridge between the two systems, and this takes a slower, a shorter amount of time to heal and to use, because you're not having to wait for the healing of that, that anastomosis, you're just waiting for the healing of the, of the graft to that small area of the vessel. Um, this has a higher risk factors for infection and clotting. Um, you might have heard the term, maybe not, steel syndrome. And in my mind, I always thought steel syndrome, S-T-E-E-L. But now it makes much more sense now that I've actually researched it, right? So steel syndrome, because blood perfusion is stolen from the extremity. So the patient will have steel syndrome distal to that, that graft in the arm. And these signs and symptoms of that are here. Pain, numbness, tingling, all those signs of hypoperfusion distal to the graft. <clears throat> yes. You're puncturing that material. Yeah, the graft is under the skin. Okay, yep. I understand that, but is there not holes left in that? It's something? Teflon, so it's a, it's a plastic material and it reseals. It does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Would it leak out? I suppose that that could be a complication that a graft. If your patient has a graft or a fistula in the extremity, remember that you never do a couple of things. You never do a blood pressure on that arm, and you never stick on that side. So the reason for that is because by doing blood pressures, you impede the flow of blood to that arm. You can exacerbate the hyperperfusion. You can also cause clotting in that arm. The reason that we don't stick sides with grafts is because you increase the risk of infection in that graft. So if this, this would be the patient's left hand, we're always going to use that right side to do anything with. What about the AVF? Right, AVF or AVG. Any vascular permanent access in the arm, you don't do um, sticks or blood pressures. Even a pick line. So if your patient has a pick line on one side, you don't stick, and you don't do a blood pressure on that side. The same purposes. All right. So this is a vas cath, it's a vas cath. Usually a vas cath is placed intrajugular. Um, you look at it and you would think probably that the, the, the vas cath was subclavian because the insertion site right here um, is subclavian, it's below the clavicle, but actually that, that's, that um, vas cath goes up over the clavicle and then goes into the IJ, the internal jugular vein there. All right. Um, so this is, you know, if the patient needs emergent or urgent um, hemodialysis, or if they're getting an AVF or an AVG, and of course they have any dialysis before that, so we would use this vas cap in the meantime. So sometimes we'll put it in a, in a femoral vein, um, but femoral central lines should remain no longer than 24 hours in the patient. High, high risk for infection. Um, but if you know they couldn't get an, an IJ in and they put they put the femoral in, we're certainly not going to DC that. We wouldn't DC any line without without an order from the physician. But realize that in general, central lines in the, in the femoral vein don't belong for very long because of increased risk for infection. You see that this line has two ports on it. The arterial side we use the arterial side as the red and the venous side as the, the blue. You realize it is a central line, so your central, so your care of it should be the same as any central line. Dressing changes, assessments, change of dressing every seven days. Generally, with these vas cats, um, the dialysis nurse will come and, and dialyze your patient, and they, they will be the ones that will do the dressing change. They prefer that, but if the dressing is not intact or is leaking or is wet, 
In the meantime, you certainly should change it. All right? Mr. Sack, yes. For the past year of cash, you have to put on this two. Can you put it on the um, here? No, it's, it has to be in a very, very large bank. Yep. Yeah. So that's why we're doing ephemeral or the IG. It could be put in the zip plate in as well. But the, the vast majority, the, the best place to put it is IG. So let's talk about the actual procedure of hemodialysis and the materials that are required for it. So I said that the dialyzer is the is the kidney of the dialysis machine. And when you when you hear people talking about dialysis, you would hear them just call it the kidney. Um, it is the functional unit of the dialysis machine. In this tube are thousands of hollow tubes, fibers, um, and those tubes are semi-permeable. So the blood passes through those things. Just think of them as tiny little straws, thousands of tiny little semi-permeable straws inside this, this uh, dialyzer here. So the blood is pumped through all of those uh, tubes, and the, the process of mainly ultrafiltration and diffusion happens and the removal of all those uh, toxins, electrolytes, ure urea, creatinine, all that stuff that the kidneys normally pull out are going to be diffused across that semipermeable membrane and the ultrafiltration will remove the um, uh, fluid. <clears throat> In addition to uh, the blood going through the, sh the, 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 the fibers, um, on the outside of these fibers, they're bathed with a uh, dialysate. So the dialysate is, and with hemodialysis, it is, dialysis is, it is non-sterile. So this um, solution contains potassium, calcium, all types of things in a, in a normal uh, state, in a normal range level. So it helps to, the purpose of that is to create um, solids. So just remember how diffusion works. The solids will move from an area of greater concentration to an area of lower concentration. So just imagine, we'll just make something up. So let's say that the patient's potassium is five. The dialysate's potassium is four. So where is the potassium gonna move? From the blood to the dialysate, right? If the patient's potassium was two, and the dialysate was four, where is the potassium gonna move? To the patient, right? So it moves from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So it also contains, usually sodium chloride, it is isotonic. So therefore, if the patient's blood is hypertonic, where's the fluid going to move? You have to remember how it's going to move, so it can move to the patient. If the, um, if the patient is, is um, diluted, and most likely they will be, so that fluid will move from the patient to the dialysate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it's not... It's not always isotonic. Sometimes they add glucose. Remember, by adding glucose to a solution or to an IV fluid or whatever makes it hyperconcentrated, right? It concentrates that solution. All right, so here are lots of assessments that we as nurses need to do before dialysis. Obviously, we would assess fluid volume status. One of the best indicators in the patient who gets dialysis is weight. Also, blood pressure, we would expect it to be up with hypervolemia, edema, heart sounds, maybe you would hear an S3 because your fluid volume overloaded, right? Lung sounds, maybe we would hear some pulmonary edema, some problems. Also, assessment of the vascular access. Um, I read somewhere uh, that, that dialysis nurses have a 90% rate of assessing if a catheter is, is appropriate to use for dialysis. So the person who does the dialysis is very good at assessing these sites, the ADF, the ABGs, and the VASCATs, to make sure that they are um, in the right state or condition to actually use the dialysis. <clears throat> All right. A big assessment here is to differentiate uh, between um, the weight after the previous dialysis. So maybe they had dialysis on Monday, they were weighed up after, after the procedure, and it was documented. They come in on Wednesday for their next dialysis uh, appointment, and you would assess their weight at that point as well. So you would document the change. So we, we finished up and they weigh 100 kilograms. They come in today and they weigh 110 kilograms. So you would realize they've gained, what, 10 liters of fluid, right? So you would expect to probably remove about that much. All right. 
and it says how much ultrafiltration is needed. What that means is how much fluid needs to be taken off. Generally, what happens here, or in the hospital anyway, what happens is that the nephrologist will write orders based off these assessments, or write an order for the nurse, and the nurse will remove the amount of fluid that has been prescribed based off of those assessments. <clears throat> When the patient is receiving dialysis before, they should be positioned uh, lying or reclined because the patient likely will have a drop of blood pressure um, and we want them to be in a position where they will not hurt themselves at all. Yes, ma'am. Well, I went down to the dialysis unit a minute and my patient, his blood pressure was 
this concentration, these components of the dialysate, run it for this long, remove this much fluid, whatever. So all those words will be written for you. Um, and as the dialysis is happening, the, the blood is being pulled from the patient, run through all this tubing in the pumps, through the dialyzer, back to the patient. So when the time is over and the, and the amount of fluid has been withdrawn uh, that was prescribed, we don't just stop it and disconnect it because by disconnecting all that tubing, you take away a lot of blood from the patient. So what you do is you flush saline through all the tubing and return all the blood to the patient. All right. Dialysis comes with a high risk for infection. So you have to maintain strict aseptic technique. And this is a closed system um, once you've connected it all. But it is open at some point, so you have to be very careful to clean well, clean all the pores as you should. During, during dialysis, vital signs use it to monitor every 15 minutes, maybe every 30 minutes in an outpatient setting. You're mainly looking for the patient's blood pressure, closely assessing their blood pressure. Yes. So the 2% that uh, perform their dialysis at home, how do they keep their, how do they keep their vital signs monitored water? Those patients would be very stable and have a good track record of not becoming hypertensive during dialysis. They're being tolerated very well. The patient who is in chronic kidney disease or whatever has a problem with their kidneys, we know is probably going to be anemic, right? So um, they may be getting blood transfusions. Um, and during dialysis for these patients is the best time to administer a blood transfusion. Why? You can immediately pull off that extra fluid. So you, you, you put in the, you know, the packed red blood cells, which you're usually going to get for a blood administration. And, you know, that's the very, very, very concentrated red blood cells, but there's still volume in it. Because if you just gave pure red blood cells, it would be solid, right? So you have to pull off that you pull off that extra fluid as the dialysis is happening. It's the best time to get the blood. So they actually run through the machine or they give it to the patient? It, they hook it up to the machine. Oh. So yeah, it's it's um, there's ports on the tubing that you can plug infusions into. Yep. <coughs> Generally, um, we think about a few types of medications that are not giving before or during dialysis. And the reason is that the dialysis machine dialyzes off these medications, it pulls them out. So you don't want to give it and then it comes right out of the patient. So in general, we think about antibiotics, antihypertensives, and antihistrythmics that are pulled off during dialysis. <clears throat> the principle behind this is basically, if a medication is protein bound, <coughs> you're good. If the medication is water soluble, then the, and it will be pulled off in that process. But obviously, we don't memorize those things, right? I certainly don't. What I do is I say, hey, Dallas, can I get this? And he'll probably, he'll probably say, no. There's this one. Just, just, you know, it's only a few hours. <laughs> so the patient, this person gets dialysis every, you know, every other morning, and they're nice to you or whatever, you would schedule their daily medications for the afternoon, right? If this patient is getting vancomycin, um, you know, VIV, then you would give it after the procedure, not during or just before, because you give it to them and it comes right out. It's not there either. Right. So, in general, what you would do is you would just say, hey, can I give this? You know, but if you're the dialysis nurse, you want to have a reference. And usually, what the dialysis, nurse, the dialysis nurses tell people is to just, just wait. Hold off, you know? But some things you, you would want to give if, it, if it's not dialyzed off and it's not in fluid or something like that or it has volume with it, you would want to give it during or before so that that volume could be pulled off during dialysis. But in general, they're, they're going to tell you to not do it. So this is a dialysis machine. It looks very scary, doesn't it? Um, so, but, but basically, this um, they, they've labeled it. So the, the concentrate is the, the dialysate. So this is the, the solution that, that bathes the dialyzer. So this is the kidney. Right. Um, and this says blood tubing from patient. So the patient is over here. It pulls the blood to the machine. And it goes through all these pumps. I don't know exactly how it goes, but um, it does. And then goes through the, the dialyzer, and it returns to the patient. Um, so it's very high tech. There's lots of settings. You can slow the, the, the 
the rate of dialysis should be slow, the rate of ultra filtration, and all of these things. If you're giving blood, does blood actually go through the machine? Before it does. Operation? I don't know exactly it's where it patient. is, but there is a port somewhere in this tubing. Maybe it's right there. There's a port that you can hook it to. And this right here is actually an IV pole. So you hang it on there, and then you would attach it to somewhere in this tubing. So the blood that you're giving is going to actually get dialysis. Of course, it'll pull up. Yeah, because it's connected to the machine. I'm not sure if it's actual, if it's on the on the entry lines or the exit lines, um, but the patient is being dialysed at that time, so that fluid would be pulled up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Post-procedure assessments are very similar to pre-procedure assessments. Wait. To, to document that post dialysis weight so that we can assess it before the next dialysis, and also to get an idea of how much is pulled off. But the the uh, whoever is performing the dialysis will know exactly how much was pulled off. That machine will tell them, uh, so and they're going to tell you, hey, I pulled off two liters, um, and you would document that amount that was taken off in your intake and output. All right. So if you're the dialysis nurse. If you're the one regulating how much is being taken off, if you're the nurse taking care of the patient not dialyzing, you need to document that I know in your health. Does that make sense? And lots of assessments. So post-procedure, we would hope that this that the DU and creatinine would come down, the hemoglobin the, the hematocrit would come up after dialysis, and the electrolytes hopefully will normalize. There are several complications to dialysis. This is this is a, uh, a fairly common one. It's called dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. Um, and this is simply because the uremia is being corrected very quickly. It causes manifestations. Um, so remember the blood-brain barrier. So the ure uremia is being pulled off of the systemic circulation in a fast, at a fast rate. But because of the, the blood-brain barrier, the uremia stays higher in the brain longer. So it takes longer for the uremia to come out of the brain. So because of that, the, um, the plasma is more hypotonic than the, than the uh, cerebral blood flow, and um, that fluid can shift into the, the brain cells and cause cerebral edema. So you want to make sure that you're assessing for this during dialysis, and here are the manifestations of it. You can have serious manifestations, even seizures. Cerebral edema, of course, you know, is nothing to mess around with, right? So, and, and this is prevented by doing dialysis for shorter periods of time, um, and maybe for slower sessions, too. So maybe you do it for a longer period of time, uh, and for, excuse me, a shorter period, and slower, right? All right, so... Hypovolemia, this is um, it's a big complication because we're pulling off fluid. But too much fluid can be pulled off. Um, and realize that a lot of the, the, the fluid that this patient has, the, the fluid volume overload, it may not all be intravascular. The patient may also have edema. So they also may have fluid in the third spaces. So when, we're, when dialysis is happening, it's pulling the volume off of the vascular system. So um, all that extra fluid, it takes time to shift intra faster right from the third spaces. So um, the manifestation of this is going to be mainly hypotension. And again, slower dialysis and maybe not pulling off as much volume. <clears throat> Think about hypotension and hypovolemia going along together. Um, uh, but to, uh, one of the differences in prevention of uh, hypotension is less removal of sodium, uh, and also uh, holding uh, antihypertensives before hemodialysis. So this patient is prone to uh, hypotension during dialysis. We would hold their antihypertensives, you know, before that. And generally, we would hold it anyway because they're dialyzed out. But we would be especially careful to hold the antihypertensives. Um, and give them afterwards if the patient is showing signs of hypertension. Because remember, most, most of our patients who are uh, needing dialysis are going to be hypertensive. So most of our patients will be on as a hypertensive So just be careful of that. Um, if the patient develops acute hypotension that is not perfusing, 
and they have uh, uh, symptoms with it, so if it is symptomatic hypotension, that dialysis should be at least slowed, if not stopped, right? So we don't want to send our patient into a pulseless situation, right? We would stop the dialysis, at least slow it. If the patient has this acute symptomatic hypotension, <coughs> then um, we, could, we could give boluses, we could put the patient on vasopressors if we had to, to get the blood pressure back up. Many times I've had patients on dialysis and they've gone in acutely hypotensive. There was one time that the dialysis nurse was nowhere to be found, that machine was just running. And um, I'm like, my patient's blood pressure is 60 over 40, you know, so I'm turning up the pressures, and, you know, giving boluses, the pressures, I just clamped the machine. I, I was like, I don't even know what to do, but I just clamped the tubing, and uh, so the dialysis stopped by me doing that. Um, it, I, luckily, it didn't clot off. But, uh, but if it did, you know, they would have just removed all the tubing and it would have been the patient. But, but yeah, so make sure your dialysis nurse doesn't clot off, too. <laughs> While you're monitoring your patient that's getting dialysis. This may seem unusual, but the patient also has a risk of hypertension during dialysis. Um, and this is mainly caused by the renin response. So when the body uh, becomes more uh, fluid deficient, the renin angiotensin system kicks in naturally. That's a normal response of the body. Um, so, and the, the end result of the renin angiotensin system is what? Vasoconstriction, blood pressure up, right? Because of what? Angiotensin 2. So, um, we do this by slowly removing fluid, much slower dialysis. So, you're seeing a trend here. So, in most lots of these complications, slower dialysis, right? Um, Treatment is increased removal of fluid. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. I think what, what, what I mean here is, is maintaining the patient's fluid volume status better. So don't let the patient get hypervolemic and then you pull a lot of fluid. You know, maybe this person would need thousands more often. Um, let's see. Realize that if the problem here is severe vasoconstriction, you know, the renin angiotensin system has kicked in, and you realize that this is the problem because their weight is, has not changed a lot, um, you, would, you would realize that they can only stay in that state for so long with the state of compens or compensation. So they will decompensate eventually. Uh, so realize that the patient may acutely become very hypotensive after because those effects will wear off and then let's go back to the vasodilated, blood pressure will fall. Okay. They experience muscle cramps. And this is also due to too much fluid being removed. The muscles aren't perfused because the volume is, is lowered in the blood. Again, lowering the rate of the fluid removal, slower dialysis, using hypertonic solutions. Um, also a risk of dysrhythmias and chest pain. And this is, again, the too much fluid being removed too quickly, and maybe the electrolytes being corrected too quickly as well. Closely monitor patients who have a history of cardiac problems for dysrhythmias and chest pain during dialysis. Right? Again, it's a trend, lowering the rate of fluid removal. And we can also use anti-dysrhythmics in these patients. The patient who has a chronic renal problem, um, or a renal problem in general, likely has platelet dysfunction, and also we're using heparin during dialysis often, and that increases the patient's uh, risk for bleeding. Infection, again, is a big respect for dialysis. So we have to do all of those things to prevent an infection. Um, and the person who is, who is in a, a state of impaired renal function has an increased risk for infection anyway. So we, not only do we have them who are immunocompromised, they also have these vascular access sites that are accessed very frequently, increasing their risk for infection. And staph is the most common um, uh, microorganism for the contamination of a vascular access site. 
And that's simply because it's normal flora on us. Because a person with, with chronic renal problems uh, often gets blood transfusions, that's why they're at increased risk for, for these disorders. Also, just getting dialysis increases your risk for these communicable diseases. Kind of scary. This is a very serious complication. It could be life threatening. Um, somehow the patient has gotten an air embolus, this means blood or uh, uh, air in the uh, systemic circulation. So, most likely, this would be because of the, the tubing wasn't primed appropriately. Um, so, you need to know the manifestations of an air embolus. And this could happen in a lot of patients just by just getting IV fluids and things like that. They could, your patients can develop an air embolus. So the biggest, the, the, the most, the, the earliest manifestation is going to be respiratory manifestations. They're going to be in dyspnea. Eventually it can lead to cardiovascular uh, collapse. So we have to make sure that our tubing is well primed there are not excessive bubbles in it, and that circuit system of tubing and machines should be always closed. If this happens, the first thing you do is to stop the dialysis and give the patient oxygen. That may require intubation, and there's a position that we put the patient in, left, left sideline and Trendelenburg. And what, what this does is it prevents the air from moving into the circulation, it kind of keeps it trapped in that ventricle so that it doesn't come out into the circulation. All right. <clears throat> you know, give them uh, fluid resuscitation, fluid boluses if uh, they are acutely hypotensive. How does it get out of that ventricle? It eventually will, will absorb. Yeah. Your body can tolerate a little bit of air in the system, It'll, it gets it filtered out in the lungs. Um, but, uh, but generally, um, any amount of air that, is, that enters the circulation greater than 10 milliliters will cause manifestation. So if you're doing your IV tubing, you got a couple of bubbles in it, that is not a big deal, okay? Uh, it takes an entire primary line of air into your patient to cause manifestations. And if it's a fairly large person, that might not even cause problems. So, I mean, I'm not saying be careless, you should certainly should be, but a couple of bubbles in your IV tubing is not a big deal. All right, so don't get, don't get too excited about that. <laughs> and we have these high-tech pumps that will detect air. So do your best to not give your patients anything IV that is not on the pump. I've seen patients that have gotten an air embolus from just hanging it by grab, and uh, that happens. All right, so just real quickly about this. This is continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT. This is basically hemodialysis. It works uh, mostly with ultrafiltration, so it's mostly the exchange of fluid in our patients. Um, and these patients are going to be very sick, probably in the ICU, and they sustain an acute kidney injury. Uh, and they need to be maintained for fluid volume status. Um, so remember that hemodialysis is a short period of time, they're fast, so this patient has to be hemodynamically stable. So the patient who is not stable would get CRRT. Um, and it can run up to 12 hours per day. Um, so in the patient that is not fluid volume overloaded and we're more focused on their um, the removal of solids and toxins, we would maintain their fluid volume status. So if, if you know if 100 milliliters gets pulled off, we're going to give them 100 milliliters. We're going to replace the volume that is pulled off one to one to maintain their uh, fluid volume status. So that's especially in the person who is hemodynamically unstable. <clears throat> there are a few different types of CRRT. Just you don't have to know a lot of details about them, but just look at this table on page 842 in your book and just kind of know any differences between the three types. Don't spend a lot of time on it. Just understand that there are differences in the procedures of CRT. I think there's three main types of CRT. Mm -hmm. All right, that was hemodialysis. Now you're prepared to go dialysis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 
peritoneal dialysis. Remember, uh, peritoneal dialysis uses the abdominal wall, uh, the peritoneal wall, as a semi-permeable membrane. Um, the peritoneal access here is called, I think we would say this, Tenchhoff, I don't know, Tenchhoff catheter, uh, that is inserted into the abdomen, into the peritoneum. Um, this is a much less complicated procedure. Um, the, the patients can often do this at home. It uh, doesn't require a lot of training. And there are fewer uh, serious adverse uh, events. It does take a long time to do peritoneal dialysis, and we'll talk about the procedure. Uh, but the major risk factor with this is peritonitis, so infection of the abdominal cavity. The patient is not very mobile while doing peritoneal dialysis. They have to be let lying down sitting <clears throat> during this procedure. So, um, and it takes a long time to do this. This person will have long periods of immobility. Could they not do it like at night? They can. Because my friend did it, and they built he built a special room in his house that was negative pressure. Air flow because of infection, I guess. Um, but he had a whole setup for that. Is it the, the tech malcastated permanent surgical insert into the stomach? Yes, surgical procedure. And yeah, but it stays there. So the patient doesn't put it in and take it out for 20 procedures. Yeah, it's surgically placed. Yeah, you're right. Um, remember in hemodialysis, the dialysate is on the outside of these uh, fibers and that the dialysate, dialysate never touches the systemic circulation. But during peritoneal dialysis, the dialysate is inserted into the abdominal cavity, so it should, of course, be sterile. Um, it will have dextrose in it, so um, the more dextrose it is, the more hypertonic it is, so the more fluid that it will be removed. So it will be prescribed. You don't have to decide this. Um, the, uh, there's lots of tubing, and there's two main bags. There's the delivery bag with the dialysate, and there's the drainage bag to collect the drainage from the nose. So this can be done by gravity, or they also have automated machines that, that infuse the fluid and pull the fluid out. So here are a few assessment things. Make sure that the patient's bladder is empty before peritoneal dialysis. Um, assess the catheter, assess the site, make sure that it's not infected, make sure that it's intact. Um, this can be an uncomfortable procedure because lots of enlargement of volume is being put into the abdomen. So if the patient can take anti-anxiety or, or uh, uh, analgesics before doing the procedure. The, the dialysate should be warm beforehand. Just in general, know that you never use a microwave to eat anything up that you put inside of the patient. Right. Um, it's happened, okay? One thing that you absolutely should never heat up is blood. Or in the microwave. It's happened, I promise. Um, so, you know, often we, we warm blood before you to a patient. We've got machines that warm it for us. We can put it in, stick it in a blanket warmer for a little bit to get it warmed up. But you never put blood in a, in a, in a microwave. You know why? You would kill somebody. Because the microwave causes lysis of the red blood cells, the patient would die from hyperkalemia. All right? Don't ever do it. You'll lose your license for that. All right? Again, just like with the hemodialysis assessment of the, the pre procedure, vital signs and the weight. All right? So during the procedure, the dialysate is put into the abdomen very quickly, and it may be up to two liters. Of volume. That's a lot of volume put into the peritoneum. Um, if the flow is not going very quickly, um, the catheter may be need to be repositioned. Maybe it's kinked. Maybe the patient needs to reposition. But it should flow in very easily and quickly. Get that two liters or one to two liters in within ten minutes. So um, after all the solution has infused into the patient's abdomen, uh, you clamp the the delivery tube. All right. Um, and then you allow the, the dialysate to, to dwell in the peritoneal cavity for about 30 to 45 minutes. During that time, the exchange of fluid is happening, the solids are moving across the semi-permeable membrane. Um, and after that amount of time, the, uh, the collection bag will be placed below the abdomen, and of course gravity to help us out here. 
um, and the clamp or the tubing that is leading to the drainage tubing, which would be the distal tubing, the distal clamp is unclamped, and then that the uh, dialysate should flow out of the patient into that um, drainage bag. It takes a little bit slower for it to drain out, but it still shouldn't take more than 20 minutes. And the fluid out most likely is going to be greater than what was put in because you expect there to be some removal of fluid. But it should at least measure the amount that you put in. All right? Because if it's less than what you put in, what's happened? There's some still in there. The patient has retained some of that volume. Of course, use gloves, biohazard, you know, throw this away, consider it, consider it contaminated fluid. It's come out of your patient. <clears throat> So this cycle, this installation of one to two liters, let it dwell for 45 minutes, let it drain out for 20 minutes, is repeated over a long period of time. So you see now why well, this is a very lengthy procedure. Why would you choose that over hemodialysis? There, there are less complications or less serious complications with it. It's actually not a very common procedure. Um, it was not long ago in, in the ICU, the, the, someone they, the physician had ordered peritoneal dialysis on a patient, and they had to go home. And the dialysis nurse came, and we thought that we were going to have to do it. But, you know, I don't know how to do this, you know. <laughs> and so the dialysis nurse comes, and like, oh, the dialysis nurse is here. You know, she can do it. She's like, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> it's very uncommon. Um, but, it, but it does happen. Well, my friend said if he had to go back on chemo, he would have killed himself. Yeah, it, that was his other choice, so he did that at home. Because he just said he couldn't bear the thought of going back and doing hemodialysis. Oh, I got you. He didn't want to do hemodialysis. Yeah. 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 Well, he has more control with peritoneal dialysis. He does it at home. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we get the first sure. <coughs> so, again, weight um, will tell you how much was removed. Because it may be difficult to measure exactly how much was removed uh, with this. You can calculate the difference between the two, but weight is a very good indicator of how much volume is taken off. Um, because the change in volume, you know, there are visible orthostatic hypertension, just like with hemodialysis. But like I said, the biggest and most serious complication is peritonitis. So know, know those uh, manifestations of peritonitis. The hallmark sign is going to be a cloudy um, uh, drainage. It's, it's, the procedure goes back to back several times over about 12 to 36 hours. Um, but I would assume it's done a few times a week. And it just depends. I think the patients who do this, will have a, one patient may have a, a routine that's very different from another patient's routine. So one, com one additional complication is um, uh, fluid that has that doesn't drain out. So incomplete recovery of fluid is what we would say. So um, if, the, if the amount is less than 500 milliliters, it's not extremely concerning. But if it is 500 or, or more, that is that is more concerning. So the person would have have symptoms of abdominal distension or something in their peritoneal cavity, right? So they would uh, complain of being bloated, full. Um, but also, we can we can tell again with weight about how much fluid was removed. To try to get the extra fluid to drain out, the patient should simply change position. So it just might be up in a little area. The patient turns on the side and might come on out. Uh, then you set them up, lay them down, put them on their side, whatever. Just change the patient's position. Um, we could also massage the abdomen to help press it out. To help prevent this. Uh, heparin can be added to the dialysate, um, and this prevents the formation of fibrous tissue, fibrous or fibrin in the drainage, which would clog the um, the, uh, the tube. <clears throat> when you put all this volume into the abdomen, you increase the pressure of the abdomen, so you have a risk of the fluid leaking out of the catheter, meaning leaking around it, not out of the tubing, but around. The, site. Um, the patient may have a new catheter that's not secured in very well, but one thing that we need to do is to determine if this is actually dialysate or is it serous fluid from the patient's body. 
Um, and we do that by testing it for glucose. If it's positive for glucose, it's a dial If it's not positive for glucose, it's called the serous fluid from the patient's body. Either way, this needs to be fixed. Uh, usually, what, what would happen is that the, the line would be better sutured in, so the physician or whoever would put more sutures in that incision site to tighten it up so that it doesn't leak. But if you have drainage or leakage from the site, you know that there's an open pathway for bacteria to get in now. So that's the biggest risk factor here is infection. If there's leakage around the catheter, the patient is at increased risk for infection. <clears throat> During the initial procedure of peritoneal dialysis, the patient's first procedure is expected that there will be a little bit of blood in the, in the output. Uh, but after that, the patient's uh, um, Drainage should be fairly clear, no, no cloudiness, no blood, should be fairly clear. If the patient has lots of blood coming out, that is always cause for concern. I mentioned peritonitis before, but that just means that the peritoneum is infected, right? So here are your manifestations. Uh, if the patient is suspected of having peritonitis, uh, a few things that should be done, um, or the main thing that needs to be done is culturing that fluid. So if the patient has suspected peritonitis, we would draw a culture of that before we give any antibiotics, right? You always draw a culture before you give antibiotics. So the best way to treat this is actually just putting uh, antibiotic into the dialysate for the subsequent procedure. So you put antibiotics directly to where it needs to go. Not necessarily given IV. Um, so the best way to do this is put it right where it needs to go. And we have access directly to the peritoneum, right? So we put antibiotics into the dialysate. Um, and then if that's for about a week, and then it's followed up with PF, PO, that should be a BX, PO antibiotics for another week. Um, of course, the number one thing that we can do to prevent peritonitis is follow a strict aseptic technique while we're uh, doing the peritoneal dialysis. Um, what else? New bags every time. They should be sealed, not sitting out. Keep everything sterile. The tubing should be changed uh, very frequently, probably with every, every um, cycle of peritoneal dialysis. So you do several exchanges. You would use the same tubing for that, but you, know, you wouldn't save the tubing over you know, for the next time because it's going to get Make sure you're checking that, that insertion site of your catheter. Like hemodialysis, we have a risk of hypotension and hypertension. Um, and it's basically the same, um, method, the same causes with hypotension is because too much fluid is being removed. Um, the, the hypertension is all, maybe because of fluid volume <coughs> overload. Uh, but also, uh, peritoneal dialysis causes lots of anxiety in patients sometimes. So uh, that can increase the patient's blood pressure. If the patient's PU and creatinine is not coming down after peritoneal dialysis, that tells us that peritoneal dialysis is not effective. <clears throat> Too much potassium might have been removed. So realize that the hemodialysis, we can much better regulate what's happening. And peritoneal dialysis, we're just letting osmosis and diffusion happen, and we hope for the best. You know, but they change the contents of the dialysate, and hopefully we get them very uh, regulated with that. But if the patient becomes hypokalemic, we would treat that by putting extra potassium into the dialysate, so that less is actually removed. The dialysate will have glucose. That's what makes it hypertonic. So it can be absorbed so the patient has a risk of hyperinflation. And to treat that, you add the insulin to the dialysate. Right? So of course, a patient with diabetes would have an increased risk of hyperinflation with this procedure. The patient might experience pain during peritoneal dialysis. Just that, again, all that volume that you're putting into there that would cause pressure and possibly pain. So um, let's see. And also the um, the irritation of the peritoneum from the chemicals in the dialysate can cause pain too. Correct irritation. Um, 
but her sign is is key to, to uh, or it's often the pain that the patient will experience during this. Uh, and this is uh, pain in the upper abdomen and shoulder, could be back pain. So if you see these manifestations, think about curve sign. Generally, when we think about curve sign uh, or this type of pain, when it's not a peritoneal dialysis situation, there's something wrong with the spleen. So just realize that the spleen is at the top of the abdominal cavity. Uh, and if there's pressure up there, or, you know, if there's irritation at that point, then it causes curse sign. Um, but, but here with peritoneal dialysis, uh, it indicates that the peritoneal dialysis is causing pressure in the upper abdomen. Does that make sense? I had that when I had a C-section, lots of pressure in my shoulder. So what about that? I have lots like of pressure severe, on your upper abdomen, right? Yeah, I like this yeah. brown. It's yeah. just up here. Because I'm here, I'm like, really. Was it after the C-section? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can often have lots of um, retained air in your abdominal cavity after yeah, the abdominal surgery. Um, so to help prevent pain, it can put lidocaine in the dialysate, which is of course uh, would numb the peritoneal cavity, hopefully would cause less pain. Maybe not as much volume, small exchanges, not delivering the dialysate too quickly into the patient, letting it go a little bit slower. And one of your interventions uh, for this, the first thing that you would do if a patient exhibited curve sign was to sit them up. By sitting them up, you decrease the pressure on the upper abdomen, it moves everything down, right? If the patient still has no relief after these interventions, uh, we would just drain the dialysate out of the patient. The first thing you do, raise the head of the bed, curve sign, right? Um, Let's talk about kidney transplant real quick. Um, the patient will be put on a kidney transplant list if they are in or approaching end-stage renal disease. Um, with kidney transplant, um, you can receive a kidney, kidney from another person, or you can receive a kidney from a person who has become brain dead. Um, this is easy to remember. Uh, the person who can donate a kidney should be 5 to 55 years old. Uh, should be free of infection, no serious systemic diseases, and have a normal kidney, right? So the person who is donating the kidney would have the surgery of a nephrectomy, right? So uh, these are specific uh, indications for a nephrectomy um, pre-op. Just realize obviously renal evaluation is going to be a priority here, and they want to go through blood and tissue typing to make sure that the person who is receiving the kidney uh, hopefully will not reject that kidney in a way match. Yes, Sandra. Coming to transplant, do the, you have two kidneys, you can survive on one. Absolutely. Do they fail at the same rate? Say it again. Like, why would someone need a kidney transplant? Do both kidneys fail at the same yeah. rate? Yeah. Okay. Because you know, compensate? So I'm trying to compensate. Well, the kidneys just simply work together. They're just two identical organs that are doing the exact same thing all the time. Um, so if the patient has you know, I don't know, maybe lupus. Well, lupus is going to affect both kidneys, not just one. Um, but generally, they're going to fail at the same, they fail at the same rate. And, and you, you said the compensatory thing, but, but what happens maybe if you have diabetes and you have damage to the glomerulus and um, the glomeruli that are not um, uh, affected compensate and take over, but because of that increase from the blood flow in those glomeruli, they then become damaged. So, um, but a bit, but yeah, so both kidneys are going to fail to you. But you only need one, you're right. Um, let's see, so post-op, um, the patient will be at an increased risk for bleeding uh, and will have lots of pain. So that's what will be our priorities, assessing for pain and assessing for bleeding. Um, also, you have to remember to assess breath sounds. Specifically here, remember that the kidneys are actually very high in, in the back. So when when having surgery on the kidney or taking a kidney out, the patient is at risk for pneumothorax, right? Because it's very high. So close to that, uh, those lines. The patient will be 
reluctant to deep breathe and to cough because of where the procedure was. It's basically nearly a chest surgery. So you want to make sure that you prevent respiratory complications. So turn, cough, deep breathe, and send it to Gail talked about organ donation. Remember that a, um, a kidney can last outside the body for the longest amount of time. Um, I think, well, one of the longest. I think the intestines can last for a really long time. But generally, we think about eight hours or so that a kidney can last outside the body. And this is the position that a person is placed in. So they're sideline, legs extended down, so that they have very good access to that uh, part of the body where the kidney needs to be. This can be a very long procedure, so they have an increased risk of impaired skin integrity. They're laying on that table. Laura's laughing. Um, it's like she's a nice body <laughs> Maybe this person is actually doing yoga. <laughs> Maybe we could call this a yoga, a yoga table. Yeah. Anyhow. Horizontal kidney position. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, for the recipient, um, they will um, be placed on immunosuppressants pre-procedure. I think it's about 12 hours pre-procedure. They will be put on immunosuppressants so they get a therapeutic level in their blood so that hopefully that received kidney will not be acutely rejected. Um, they are in renal failure, um, so therefore they would be dialyzed. We would be all their electrolytes in balance. We would get them in a normal eubolemic state. We want to get their body to the most, the most normal state possible with dialysis before uh, surgery. Remember that a person who has active infection just can't have surgery in general. So we want to assess for surgery, um, assess for infection, uh, and report that. They also, of course, will undergo blood and tissue typing, just like the donor, to make sure they're going to receive that kidney well. And the person who is receiving a kidney is going to be worried about the person who is donating it to them. Often it's a family member. So they're going to be very concerned and worried about this person who is undergoing a major surgery to give them an organ. So that's going to be a big, a big issue. They will be worried and afraid for that. And they may likely experience feelings of sadness if they are receiving a kidney from a person who has died. So they realize that I got this kidney because somebody else died. So lots of psychosocial things are happening here to this patient. So uh, just realize that this patient will experience those things, and you are the one there that are assessing and comforting these patients. Um, when the kidney is placed, the kidney transplant, the other kidneys are left intact. They are not taken out, uh, most likely. They, they, the, the kidney that is received is placed uh, in the pelvis. It's, it's placed much lower and it's placed in that iliac crest, and it's protected by it. Yeah. Yeah. Water level three kidneys? Yeah, that three oh, kidneys. Wow. So, um, so, the, the, uh, so obviously, this new kidney is not going to be attached to the renal arteries and veins. It's going to be attached to the iliac vein and the iliac arteries. But essentially, the, 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 uh, the old kidneys are not going to function at all anymore. So the renal artery veins will be tied off. So eventually those, those, those um, kidneys will just shrink down in size um, and just be non-functioning and non confusing. Why don't they just go ahead and take them out? Because the adrenal glands are there. You know, once they got the adrenal glands, right? you need those to live. Right? <laughs> so, um, what else? Yeah, adrenal glands remain intact. Um, you, the person who receives the kidney often does very well afterwards. So they have this functioning kidney, and their body's processing that stuff really well. So they often have a very good response after surgery. Um, if that kidney does, like we expect it to, immediately function, they start making urine, uh, then they have a very good long-term prognosis. But if it takes more time for that kidney to kick in, then their prognosis long-term is not as good. So we want that kidney to immediately function. But until then, we will still support that patient to make sure that they don't have complications of uremia before it starts working. Mr. Mr. Yes. Harrison, what happens to the donor's uh, adrenal vein? 
Um, I think they would attempt to leave it intact, um, but it, it, I would assume it would be very difficult to separate it. But if they have one adrenal gland, they should still be able to produce enough hormone, but um, they would leave it, leave it there. Um, obviously, the person who receives an organ from someone else has a risk of rejection. It's a, you know, a, an autoimmune response. So just realize these are just definitions. Hyperacute, acute, and chronic. So hyperacute is going to happen very quickly. Acute happens over a, would happen over a longer period of time. The chronic happens after several years of receiving a kidney transplant. And the body just attacks it. It sees it as foreign. It creates antibodies against that kidney. And the antibodies will actually infiltrate the kidney and cause um, uh, thrombosis and uh, um, fibrous tissue to fill the kidney, and then it will just fail. Um, I thought this was neat. So these are manifestations of acute or of kidney rejection. Um, so again, hyperacute is within a couple of days, and they will uh, manifest these symptoms, tiredness, fever, uh, because the immune system has kicked in, seeing something as foreign, so you develop a fever, um, and that site will be very tender. Um, acute, like I said, is maybe up to two years, but they would experience basically these signs of, of uh, renal disease, oliguria, anuria, and also uh, a fever. Um, but the blood pressure would increase because the kidney is no longer functioning. Mm -hmm. have only fluid. The vena and creatin and potassium would then begin, begin to rise again. Um, so these, most of these are manifestations of just renal disease. So that kidney um, starts going bad too? This, if this kidney starts going bad, it's, it's really good. Yeah. Um, and then chronic, it simply means that they um, develop these symptoms of, after a longer period of time. So again, these are manifestations of, of kidney failure. How long does a kidney transplant last normally? Yeah, I, the only thing that I know for sure how long it lasts is a heart transplant, and that's 10 years. Um, but I think I've heard of a kidney transplant lasting longer. So it can last up to uh, you know, maybe 20 years. I heard something recently that a person uh, had a kidney transplant and it lasted several decades. So, but I don't know what the average is. So uh, it only lasted 10 years. It lasted 10 years, yeah. I know that a heart transplant lasts 10 years. But, but, but that's, just, that's a good point in general to realize that organ transplants probably not going to last that person's whole life. Um, I have a patient that, uh, that I see in the clinic and she's had two heart transplants. Mm -hmm. And she's not even 18 years old. Yeah. So, um, they don't they don't last forever. So obviously, you know, uh, to prevent that uh, that rejection, um, we want to make sure that the, that the donor is an excellent match for the patient. As they type and cross very well to that patient, to to the recipient, and we prevent it also by giving mainly immunosuppressants, also corticosteroids, which in effect are immunosuppressants. Um, but the, the immunosuppressants that we need to focus on are sand, excuse me, sandimune and inuran. We talked about inuran before. Uh, so basically, it just suppresses the, the, the patient's immune system so that hopefully it doesn't build antibodies to this one kidney. Um, the, the medication is started uh, about you know, 4 to 12 hours before the procedure. We want to have them with a, a therapeutic level of uh, of immunosuppressants before the surgery so that they won't, hopefully they won't have an acute uh, rejection. Um, keep in mind that, that immunosuppressants are hard on the kidneys. So it's kind of a, uh, you have to give it, but they are they are nephrotoxic, also hepatotoxin. How long do they take them? Forever? Forever. Yep. Um, so lots of side effects of these immunosuppressants. Um, the ones that we're most concerned about uh, are going to be the hepatotoxicity, the nephrotoxicity, which may be a little bit worse, um, and uh, dysphagia. So those major complications of uh, immunosuppressants. The number one complication, of course, is infection.
you would teach your patient, like Chris said, that they would have to take these medications forever. It doesn't mean that the dose may not be changed. It doesn't mean that the medication may not eventually change. They may be sort of on a high dose and titrated down to lower doses of immunosuppressants. So with any medication, of course, you want to have the lowest effective dose possible uh, because with lower doses, you have less complications or side effects. Um, so this person will see their nephrologist, primary care provider, very frequently, uh, probably every three months, closely monitoring renal, liver, and uh, the CDC for infection. Right? <laughs> done, done, right? So that's it. Uh, wait, 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 I want a picture. So, any questions? Test is Thursday. Right. Um, you've already been studying. Right, Laura well, Laura started studying three weeks ago. So, um, how, how are we going to do this test? We'll do uh, 30 renal, right, and 20 of the other stuff. Okay. Sound good? Yes. I think that's good. That's good. I'll think about it. <laughs>